So, once upon a time, it's been suggested the Earth was a big ball of ice. Now, it's possible that there may have been some methane-chewing worms under all of that. Or maybe even before these flatulent addicts, nothing but tiny microbes who somehow produced enough CO2 to kickstart the whole life diversity thing, and everything warmed up. Now, from time to time, the Earth got a bit colder. But for a big chunk of it, it's been pretty warm, which favoured our scalier cousins with large thigh bones, until their appointment with a large hunk of rock and the deleterious effects of the Deccan Straits cut off most of the sunlight, poisoned the atmosphere, and they had to put up with evolving into giant malevolent turkeys. Then some miserable, hairy, endothermic, milk-producing interlopers took over, and ultimately gave rise to a bunch of simians so up themselves that two million years later they decided to purposely put everything in jeopardy. Everton, Everton's gonna be a fish, or at least that what will die in the eternal springs of man's torment. I got the planetary blues. I got the planetary blues. I got the planetary blues, but I ain't gonna have much longer. I got the planetary blues I got the planetary blues Oh, I got the planetary blues But I ain't gonna get much longer Oh yeah, you got CFDs and HFDs from refrigerators You clap a couple of people been waiting for ages Green out is bad, you know, you know where I stand The deep power stations we ain't never had Come on, baby, when you speak up Cause they ain't much higher stakes You got the planetary blues And I got the planetary blues Oh yeah, I got the planetary blues But I ain't gonna have much longer I got the planetary blues I got the planetary blues Oh yeah, I got the planetary blues You got rain falling, phosphorus in this O2. If you leave more examples, I'll see what I can do. We eat on the planet and do a whole lot of shit. And if my missus ain't hurt, I'll have to amplify it. Other problems exist, that bad and bad enough. But if you like alcohol, you know that it's gone. I got the planetary blues. I got the planetary blues. Oh yeah, I got the planetary blues, but I ain't gonna have much longer. I got the planetary blues. I got the planetary blues. Oh yeah, I got the planetary blues, but I ain't gonna have much longer. Yeah, yeah, I got the planetary blues, but I ain't gonna have it much longer. Hey, yeah, I got the planetary blues, but I ain't gonna have it much longer. <laughs> And here we are. Now, there have been some considerable difficulties in persuading people of the problems caused by our reliance on trace gas producing fuels. To be fair though, this has not always been helped by the advocates of the environmental cause. And I'm not always convinced that in the initial stages, climatologists were that great at explaining their science. A number of weather stations are in towns. There are a number of ways that one can account for that problem. Uh, 
the obvious way is just to eliminate those stations from the data set that you use to calculate the large area average temperature values. If the sea level rises, and those projections range anywhere from uh, a few tens of centimeters to maybe a meter, so, a meter or so in the next 100 years, that by itself is not that serious except to places that are low lying, the Maldives and, and uh, Venice and probably London. But what really is serious is if the warming of the oceans causes an increase in the energy source for severe storms, then you get a higher probability of more intense hurricanes or uh, other severe storms driven by ocean evaporation. Some tide gauge uh, stations show the sea level rising over long periods of time. Others show sea level falling during other periods of time. The problem is that the land is also moving up and down. In some places it moves up considerably fast, in other places it, it falls, it subsides fairly fast. So you're measuring the sea level uh, against a level, another level that's moving up and down. And that leaves you with a lot of uncertainty about how much the ocean is moving versus how much land is actually moving. The problem is with climate, there's a lot of things going on. This is not soundbite science. So I'm going to tell you a lot of complicated stuff. Um, I'll try to be entertaining. Some of it will be boring. I apologize in advance. But with climate, you hear a lot, of, a lot of stuff. You see greenhouse gases are warming the globe. Sunspots actually cause the warming. These are actually the sunspots from Tuesday. I doubt you could, there's, a, there's a, 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 a NOAA site that you can go to and get the latest sunspot data. That's the latest sunspot data. That we're in ice age. That the glaciers are melting. Sea level is rising. CO2 is natural. CO2 was a lot higher in the past. CO2 was a lot lower in the past. That the Earth is a lot warmer in the past. The Earth was a lot colder in the past. <laughs> and the problem is that everything here is true. Two weather maps for, it's actually not, this is not the storm itself. This is the weather map a couple of days before the storm struck. And the two maps, if you look at them, uh, superficially, they look very, in fact, they are very similar, but they differ very, very slightly. They differ by the fact that, you know, when we observe the weather from satellites or from uh, surface observations, we never observe things absolutely perfectly. And this is going a little over a century ago, how uh, refri electric refrigeration became, uh, became to be, uh, of course, very common, very useful. Uh, first in developed countries, but then eventually everywhere. And that's using electrical refrigerators. Yes, very clear. It sometimes seemed like their explanation was, look, this is happening, don't worry about the physics, we'll simplify it by the not very satisfying greenhouse effect, we'll furthermore talk about global warming, but until that actually starts happening, we'll call it climate change. Our models are totally correct, no they're not, Yes, they are, oh, sodgy bunch of ignorant redneck tossers, just believe us. We've seen humorless teenage girls on a one adolescent angst-ridden crusade who seem to bring out much anger in middle-aged men who choose to concentrate on the messenger rather than the message. Money, 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 money. Money. In turn, actual economic realities seem to upset a lot of young rebellious types who have a tendency to ignore that the society they so despise has a bit more going for it than genuine dictatorships, right or left or feudalism, and have about as much grasp of history as a Hollywood film. Freedom! And that the economic structure, which has innumerable flaws when it comes to social and financial equality, is probably the only system that prevents 7 million human beings all going a bit J.G. Ballard and dystopic. For me, economic collapse, unemployment and starvation is the best way to try and persuade the many twonks who currently reside in the sticking their head in the sand in the hope it's cooler down there school of thought. I personally feel the value of industrial and economic development is the most compelling argument to restructure our methods of energy supply, waste management and possibly developing some plausible but desperate measures to curb the current crisis. 
Although it might help certain gun-toting tribes who worship a white supremacist oversized Oompa Loompa, that the way radioactive heat is trapped and then released is the same kind of physics they use with night vision scopes and goggles when they're out to massacre some unfortunate animal for fun or do a recreation of deliverance. COVID-19 has shown people how vulnerable we are and dependent on many of the modern conveniences we have come to depend on and that has allowed this particular simian breed to become so successful. Too bloody successful. Ding, ding. But it's not the number of human beings that is the problem, is it? It's consumption. It's all you have to do. Do the shake and back. And the vast majority of people's desire to live in greater comfort and ease. I know there are some well-meaning hipsters who've opted for living in their cars and eating plant-based gruel, but for many people, this is not a step forward in human development or personal hygiene. I got the cars, I got the plastic, I can buy anything that I want to. I'll sell you a house, sell you some jeans, I'll sell you Before people start to attack this point of view, we have to recognise that when economic systems break down, Humans don't tend to join hands and dance around the maypole, exhorting everyone to brotherly and sisterly love. It generally becomes more like a ritual out of the wicker man. Just look at Russia in 1917 or Cambodia in 1975, and you'll see what a pleasant society it is when everything breaks down. So perhaps we should try to deal with many social ills one by one. But firstly, let's try to get to the middle of the century without being buried under 20 feet of seawater. And this is what we have to explain to businesses, and then possibly governments. I'm not going to dwell on the many horrific predictions that will ensue if CO2, methane, nitrogen oxide and water vapour becomes too dominant in the atmosphere as to make it impossible to reverse the worst case scenarios. I'll leave that to various movies starring Bruce Willis. Instead, I want to concentrate on some alternative ideas in the debate to deal with our current climate crisis. One of the many concepts that's gained traction in recent years is the personal carbon footprint. Bickerton. Bickerton. Look at me, I've ditched my old car Bickerton. and I've bought this super equipped racer, the production of which will take many years longer to offset the CO2 that was created to produce it than me driving my old banger Bickerton. from 2002. Go bag a Bickerton. It suits governments to sell the personal responsibility bit, as that exonerates them from doing anything meaningful other than persecuting drivers. It suits companies that sell things that aren't very appealing to eat to suggest that their mass-produced fungal product is going to change the planet. But I always drink plenty of... Mark? And it suits people who, for various reasons, choose to self-flagellate themselves in denial that can view the rest of us evil people with the you're polluting scum of the earth self-congratulatory look as they pay £10 for a worm-eaten lettuce from the House of Smugness. Don't get on my bad side, make some vegan gains, and be nice to animals or I'll kill you. However, we do all have to start thinking about what we consume. And more importantly, how the energy to create those things is produced. Because for me, the point about consumerism in this particular case is not to do with the evils of capitalism, but the realisation that something we assumed was harmless, e.g. coal, oh, someone should mention that to Scott Morrison, by the way, oil and natural gas are unfortunately not so harmless after all. A bit like wife swap or made in Chelsea. You're a fucking wanker. Let's forget about the Marmite or Vegemite love or hate consumerism thing, because this is not really the point of this programme. I don't believe people are seriously wishing to embark on a Rousserian vision mixed with unfunny episodes of The Good Life. We have to look at humanity and recognise it generally works better when societies are cooperating. We'll make a one of us a loving cup, a loving cup. We accept a one of us, we accept a one of us. Gooba gobble, gooba gobble. We Is flying everywhere. The watch is on the plane, and my boss got no more stuff to spare. La la la.
Surprisingly, for a miserable cynic like myself, I applaud the gift gaff campaign to persuade people to ditch the unnecessary obsession with purchasing the latest iPhone and see this as a genuine insight into one possible direction in order to alter consumerist habits. Possibly utility will have to come back in a big way. Underground, overground, wombling free. So to begin with, let's roll back things about nine years and have a jolly 2011 breakdown chart of Armageddon. At number eight is Super Hexafluoride SF6. Yes, folks, lasts around 3,200 years and negligible pre-industrial levels at 0.007 parts per billion volume. Not the biggest concern, which is lucky as its warming potential is up at 17,500 every 20 years and 23,500 for every 100 years. Its main source is dielectric fluid, which is used as electrical insulators in high voltage applications, e.g. transformers, capacitors, high voltage cables and high voltage switch gear. New in at number seven, purofluoromethane or PCF14 to its friends hangs about in seedy atmospheres for 50,000 years and again has never been known to spontaneously exist prior to some bloody hairless ape with godlike pretensions. In 2011 it was at 0.079 ppbv and is the product of the production of aluminium so planes, trains and automobiles to pointlessly squeeze in an 80s film reference. It can warm a frosty atmospheric reception at 4,880 every 20 years and it goes up to 6,630 every 100 years. Next up at 6, that well-known gas named after a 90s lending institution HCFC22, nicknamed CHCIF, a bit shorter on the old lifespan, only hanging in at 11.9 years, and has never been known to occur naturally. At 0.213 ppbv, it's a little more plentiful, liquid coolants are its thing, 5,280 warming potential is its thang. It does diminish considerably after 100 years though, at 1,760, so that's alright then. Sneaking past its old mate at number 5, its more famous cousin, CFC-12. This pesky devil sticks around for 100 years. Mother Nature has no hand in its invention, and at 0.213 ppbv, this liquid cooler and foam maker has the potential to warm the atmosphere at about 10,500 every 20 years, and sticks to almost that figure at 10,300 every 100 years. It also increases the chance of those leathery English people in Spain getting that desperately needed melanoma as they barbecue themselves on the beaches. Wandering in nonchalantly at number four is that well-known product of fertilizer, industrial processes, whatever that means, fossil fuel combustion, and friend to crazed would-be bombers everywhere. NO2 and NO, or nitrogen oxide for those listening to speeches from the Mayor of London's office. It was about 275 ppbv before man got in on the act and has increased by 18% to 324. It warms things up by 264 every 20 years, but lucky us, due to the fact it sticks around for 121 years only, increases 265 by every 100 years. Huh? That's an increase, isn't it? Barging past in the number three spot is CH4. Yes, methane sticking around for 12.4 years before industry got in the act was a concentration of 700 parts per billion, but has now gone up to 1803. That's an increase of 25% folks. It's made from fossil fuels, as usual, rice, ooh, that's a new one, waste dumps, such as landfill, <laughs> cows burping, and Trump talking out of his ass. We're the highest taxes nation in the world. We have nobody knows what the number is, but I mean, it used to be, when we talked during the debate, 2.5 trillion, right? when the most elegant person, right? I call him Mr. Elegant. It's a bugger, as it warms things up at 84 every 20 years, but it goes down to 28 every 100 years. At number two, I bet you all thought this was going to be number one, but it isn't, CO2. The most famous in our rundown, sticks around for at least 80 years, was about 278 parts per million, and is now up to 391, about 40% up. It's made by, yes, burning fossil fuels, land use changes, and cement production. Bloody mafia. The management. Its warming potential is at one every 20 or 100 years. 
but the number one spot, like a veritable single by Brian Adams in the 90s, goes to Water Vapor. Yes, good old H2O, in the form of clouds. Yes, clouds, bloody clouds. Big, white, fluffy, friendly, sneaky, bastard, interloping gits heating everything up. To be fair though, clouds have been around for a long time and there are natural feedback systems emitting infrared energy in both directions. It's the recent anthropogenic antics of these hairless apes that have made clouds so sinister. And on the upside, it does stop hours and hours of tedious televised cricket. Now I'm not going to waste a lot of time describing alternative theories as to why the Earth is heating up, and trying to deny the evidence of involvement of these particular gaseous reprobates who are like stubborn serial killers with blood all over their shirt wielding an axe. Far too much time has been wasted on Nigel Lawson already, but just for a bit of light relief, here's a list to entertain you. I call it the five stages of denial. We've got to slow down. I disagree. We've got to speed up. Denial. Yes, to begin with, there were no limits to attempt to firstly deny that the world was heating up. For proponents of the greenhouse effect, it heralds something akin to an apocalypse. An earth parched and scorched by the sun. A climate in chaos. Nor is it a theory supported by a few cranks. It's been endorsed by the great and the good, by politicians and academics. There's only one problem. There's mounting evidence that it's not true. Then it was heating up but man had nothing to do with it. But as I learned more and more about the issue, I discovered that maybe it's not as bad as it's made out to be. Some of it is hype, but there's also some data that has not been explored, and there's been some investigations that need to be done that haven't been done. And so now I'm in the camp of, we have some global warming, no doubt about it, but it may not be as bad as we originally thought because there are other contributing factors. Anger. There's something I felt very uncomfortable watching yesterday. It was all a little melodramatic. It was all Mass end of the world, extinction. apocalyptic. I don't want millions, if not billions, of young people watching Greta do that kind of speech and genuinely think the planet is literally about to end, because it isn't. So climate change is serious, well, has to be dealt with. It's urgent but the, and pressing. It is. It's an important issue, but it's not end of the world stuff. The climate hysteria movement is not about science. If it were about science, it would be led by scientists rather than by politicians and a mentally ill Swedish child. Somebody needs to read poor Greta Genesis chapter nine and tell her next time she worries about global warming, just look at a rainbow. That's God's promise that the polar ice caps aren't gonna melt and flood the world again. <laughs> Uh, I think that some people are, they put it at a level that is, you know, unrealistic uh, to a point you can't live your lives. We want to have the cleanest water on earth. We want to have the cleanest air on earth. Our numbers, as you saw, we had record numbers come out very recently. Our numbers are very, very good. Our environmental numbers, our water numbers, our, our numbers on air are tremendous. Uh, we have to do something about other continents. We have to do something about other countries. Uh, when we're clean and beautiful and everything's good, but you have another continent where the fumes are rising at levels that you can't believe. I mean, I think Greta ought to focus on those places, but we are doing better right now than we've ever done in terms of cleanliness, in terms of numbers. Uh, we have a beautiful ocean called the Pacific Ocean, where thousands and thousands of tons of garbage flows toward us, and that's put there by other countries. So I think Greta has to start working on those other countries. Mr. President. Mr. President. Boys with a K in it up, funny. You didn't know that, did you? The merest appearance of Greta Thunberg seems to get middle-aged pink males foaming at the mouth, and all sorts of accusations not always specious, that these radicals are out to destroy our way of getting rich. I mean, business. I mean, I mean, I mean way of life. War on terror, I, I don't know, something. Bargaining. Oh, do it to Julia. Do it to Julia. Not me. Julia. I don't care what you do to her.
we know that as a responsible and ethical company, you're doing what you can to reduce your carbon footprint. We also know how challenging that can be. That's why we're delighted to now offer a solution that helps you further reduce harmful greenhouse gases and at the same time benefits communities around the globe. If I pretend to subsidise something seen as good, can I keep polluting anyway? The first mistake Mrs Foster's energy team made was setting the rate of payment too high. What they do is they pay you an amount for the heat that you generate. But what's actually happened here is that they've set a rate which is higher than the cost of the fuel in the boiler. Therefore, you're actually incentivized to run the boiler for as many hours as possible. Repression. Don't run. We are your friends. <laughs> lie and we're going to bury any evidence to prove it. Alright guys, today I'm going to talk to you about the fake version of the greenhouse effect which climate science and climate physics and climate change and anthropogenic climate change and climate alarm was all based on. A device which will destroy all human and animal life on earth. Ah, it's an obvious common trick Mr. President, we're wasting valuable time. Look at the big boy, they're getting ready to clobber. Acceptance. Benjamin predicted he could look forward to a well-earned rest and retirement. I'll be dead by the time it happens, so it really doesn't matter to me. Do you still feel that you're doing enough? You how, talk how, about old, clean how old is she? She's uh, 17, 17 now. Oh, yes. That's good. So I think we've established that we've fucked things up royally. The trouble is, humanity wants industrial progress and social mobility. But industrial progress and social mobility cusps. And right now is where humanity starts paying. Sorry, another 80s cultural reference then. Before investigating various solutions, some currently in place, others that are a bit wacky, I thought it'd be a lot of fun to look at the different ways we're advancing the cause of planetary destruction relating to climate change. Oh, the winter nights are just going to fly by. Quite literally, in fact. Now, it's popular to divide the various polluting industries into sectors. A bit like the 32 stages of death. Energy, electricity and heat, 24%. Industry, 14.7%. Transportation, 14.3%. Other fuel combustion, 8.6%. Fugitive emissions, fugitive emissions, 4%. Agriculture, 13.8%. Land use change, 12.2%. Industrial processes, 4.3%. Waste, 3.2%. Road transport, 10.5%. And air transport, excluding additional warming impacts, 1.7%. Other transport, 2.5%. Fuel, power and for residential buildings and stuff, 10.2%. Fuel and power for commercial building 6.3% oh that's interesting unallocated fuel combustion 3.8% iron and steel production 4% aluminium and non-ferrous metal production 1.2% machinery production 1% pulp paper and printing 1.1% food and tobacco industries 1% chemicals production 4.1% cement production 5.0% cuddly toy no sorry other industries 7.0% transmission and distribution losses 2.2% coal mining 1.3% oil and gas production 6.4% deforestation 11.3% Reforestation, minus 0.4%. Oh, that shouldn't be in there, should it? Harvest and land management, 1.3%. Agriculture, energy use, 1.4%. Agricultural soils, 5.2%. Livestock and manure, 5.4%. Rice cultivation, 1.5%. Other cultivation, 1.7%. Landfill of waste, 1.7%. Wastewater and other waste, 1.5%. And that's just CO2. Being a bit partial, and the fact that I don't want to go through every pollutant in this little film, let's just run down the other biggie, methane. As we've seen in the game of GHG top trumps, CO2 is ahead just because of its habit of hanging about when it's not wanted, which leads to it being more plentiful in the atmosphere. But some might argue methane is even worse, as it's a lot more effective at warming things up. So here's the best way of bringing about an unpalatable future.
Lagging behind at 10% of natural methane emissions globally, oceans creating 90 million tonnes of methane per year, partly because of microbial bastards sitting around with nothing better to do than producing CH4. Stinky past is another bunch of useless git termites creating 12% of natural methane emissions. Each little six-legged bugger produces small amounts of methane on a daily basis, but because there's so many of them, they emit 20 million tonnes of the stuff per year. Whizzing past them at 147 tonnes of CH4 annually are those boggy old wetlands producing 78% of natural methane emissions. Still, the way we're heating things up, that probably won't be a problem for much longer. But now we're into the anthropoid causes. So it's biofuels at the bottom of human contribution, with about 12 million tonnes of methane. At 4%, it's the bioproduct of domestic cooking, heating and lightning. A little bit of low technology enterprises such as brick or tile making kills, and for transportation. <coughs> then there's that old favourite of the mung bean eating, wicker knitting westerners and most of Southeast Asia, rice agriculture, which is 9% of human emissions, creating 31 million tonnes of methane per year. Coming in at 11 is biomass burning. Yes, Bosonaro, burn down those forests, you dick. Biomass burning creates 38 million tonnes of methane per year. But chasing its heels is landfills and waste at 16% of human methane emissions. Landfills and waste produce 55 million tonnes of methane per year. But zooming past landfill and waste is intensive livestock farming. Yes, all those gammon-faced Midwestern burger-eating NRA supporters and rich people in Indonesia and no, yes, the rest of us who find the prospect of eating corn too depressing, create 27% of human methane emissions, with 90 million tonnes of methane a year. But as usual, the winner is burning and distribution of fossil fuels, still the biggest culprit at 33%, producing 110 million tonnes of methane per year. I can't believe it. That's just what I was expecting. My God, it's funny how we slow down just as we get to the end of the race. So how do we actually reduce emissions effectively? Well, let's have a look then. Firstly, recycling, which is seen as the best waste management policy and has been championed, if in a somewhat haphazard manner, by governments and green activists alike. Once the guys had left, Friday afternoon it was like a, a big frisbee fight, and then what we used to do, we used to get the glass, boil some water, put the down under demo on top of the glass. When you pour boiling water over vinyl, or certainly the vinyl as it used to be, used to shrivel up and would make rather a nice little ashtray or a beautiful little flower vase, a present to take home in the evening. But is it actually as effective as one might hope? And here comes the punchline. Recycling? A load of rubbish? It might seem a natural assumption that recycling would solve all our waste management aims, reduce CO2 and CH4 emissions, and be a wonderful way in which all of us could contribute to a greener planet and feel nice and smug and judgmental on anyone so much as daring to use a normal bin. Look at that, you polluting bastard. That sweet wrapper could be used to wallpaper a small box, which could then be put in the recycling and then sent off for a nice round trip to China and then back again to end up in landfill. Today, about a quarter of everything consumers place in recycling bins ultimately can't be recycled by the programs that collect them. These include such items as food waste, rubber hoses, wire, low-grade plastics, and many other items that overly hopeful residents toss in. Such materials waste hauling space and fuel, jam up machinery, contaminate valuable materials, and pose hazards to workers. In response to this problem, China, which takes in a significant portion of recycling material collected in the US for processing, will now only accept shipments with a contamination rate of 0.5% or less. All piss taking aside, there are serious questions though. So people who don't like recycling say this. Recycled materials are not always that useful. There is a finite amount of big plastic buckets and toilet paper we can use, although try telling that to anyone using a rolled up copy of the Evening Standard during the Covid lockdown. It also takes a fair amount of energy to clean and reutilise recycled material. Try watching reruns of 70s sitcoms and well you get the idea. The problem is, there is only so much demand for sandals made out of radials and lampshades made out of reconstituted hemp. But on the other hand, the old style of landfill really offers very little in the way of effective waste management, unless you're looking for copies of the Daily Express during the lockdown. It's just a
And the people who do like it retort, Non-durable goods made of paper, excluding newspapers, had a recycling rate of 48.3%, while newspapers had a recycling rate of 76.8%. Paper, containers and packaging, excluding corrugated boxes, had a recycling rate of 15.3%, whilst corrugated boxes had a recycling rate of over 88% in 2017. According to the Environmental Paper Network's paper calculator, it takes about 32 million BTUs of energy to produce one tonne of virgin paper fibre. In regards to aluminium, 39% of new materials can be made using recycled metals at an energy saving of 95%. Lead, which is recycled at about 74%, has an energy saving of 60%. Steel, at 42%, has a saving of between 62 and 74%. Well, basically, that seems to suggest recycling is a good thing, but not as funny as the skeptic's point of view. Then again, we could always burn everything just to annoy Greta Thunberg. Okay, so what's been said about energy from waste then? The other possible solution to waste management. Well, it might seem counterintuitive that incinerating waste is the best way to reduce emissions. It produces lots of nasty carcinogenic dioxins, CO2 of course, and there seems to be a great deal of worry about ash. Proponents say bollocks. No, they don't actually say that. I just felt like throwing in an inoffensive swear word. What they actually say is that chemical wet scrubbing and so forth removes the nasty gases and the horrible ash can be used in road building, which is strange because I always thought they used magic beams to make our roads. That's why they're so durable during winter. I have to admit, I used to favour EFW, not to be confused with any of its other 70s prog rock rivals or forceful rap groups of the 90s, but in undergoing this research, I'm not so sure now. On the other hand, my amoeba brain does have one question, which is if recycled materials are so viable and it's such a good means of managing waste, why isn't it more universally adopted? It can't all be right-wing extremists just trying to annoy the Extinction Rebellion. The problem is proponents from either camp are so entrenched in their views, some due to economic motives, that it's hard to verify the absolute truth. Technology has moved on since I first wrote about this, but as far as I can ascertain, there is a value in a mix, which was demonstrated in this little OU doc from the 80s, all about this very subject, set in Cologne. Sounds like another winner sleepathon we can pass off as drama in a British film, starring, I don't know, Julie Walters or somebody. The first stage, and arguably the most cost effective part, is here, where large, bulky items are selected by a man machine combination. The man provides the material recognition, the machine gives him the muscle to remove it. It's essential to remove these items now to prevent jams later on in the separating machinery. The remaining smaller size mixed assortment of potentially reusable materials must be segregated by rotating or vibrating. <laughs> Moving right along transport. Let's start off with cars. Yes, cars. Nothing brings out vociferous debate and name-calling like personal vehicular transport. I call it Clarkson plus Khan equals CO2 plus CH4 cubed as vast amounts from Trump-like material pour out of their mouths. It's best not to be around. The problem is people who drive cars hate those who don't because they are totally unaffected by the increasingly draconian measures to get us all on our bikes. So Norman Tebbit would approve. And those who don't drive hate those who do, with a smug, tedious satisfaction coming from a primary school teacher banning Christmas or Barbar Black Sheep, neither of which actually occurred, by the way. 
So globally, how much do these stereotype gammon face moccasin driving patrons contribute annually to emissions? Well, figures vary, but road transport is estimated between 16 to 23 percent of emissions, and 53 percent of that is cars and the odd rickshaw. So there you have it, between 8 to 11 percent of the global emissions are Clarks. This is quite a lot, but would suggest that stopping all personal motor use wouldn't quite have the significant effect that the cyclist brigade would desire. So should we all go electric? Well, firstly electricity has to come from somewhere. So it's not as if just driving that nice nice new shiny shiny polluting battery mobile will offset all emissions. But the other thing is the production of every new vehicle comes at a pretty high carbon cost. Producing that nice new family sized box on wheels generates around 17 tonnes of CO2. Almost as much as three years worth of gas and electricity in a typical UK home. Although you should see my ex-girlfriend's heating bill. She gets cold on a summer's day under 25 blankets. My own take on it is that all new cars should be electric. But we shouldn't all go out and buy one. Going back to my utility versus consumption view. I think reducing our use but still maintaining an old car is probably less energy intensive. But there is that thing called the oil industry. So that has to be factored in. Even so, as much as all of this may make us feel much better, unless of course you have lots of stuff to take to the municipal recycling centre and realise that your push bike won't quite cut it, the truth is getting rid of old cars is not going to solve the world's climate crisis. But it may help. A bit. <laughs>
the anthropogenic methane emissions came from livestock. In that same report, it was stated that 53% of anthropogenic nitrogen dioxide emissions were also coming from livestock. Not only that, but 14.5% of CO2 emissions, that's about 7.1 gigatons per year, were largely due to forest clearance, which is the main cause of deforestation in Amazonian countries. Unfortunately for the poor old chickens, nature's very own flightless, virtually defenceless larder, they produce less emissions generally. And unfortunately for these creatures who've been dealt a very bad evolutionary hand, when industrially farmed, are even more carbon economic than free range or organic. This is just GHG related, I'm not looking at the philosophical or moral points here. On the whole, vegans are right. Us meat-eating dairy munchers are all irresponsible bastards who should self-flagellate ourselves with bits of gluten-free pasta. But as I mentioned, before all these pallid individuals looking for protein replacements feel too smug, people who live in wicker houses, blah blah blah, there are other agricultural emissions too. हवा में झूमती चावल की फसल जिसका हर दाना बीतता है दुआओं की बारिशों में फिर सूरज की किरणें इनका रंग निखारती हर दाने में सेहत और जायके का जश्न समेट Yes, and first on the list are paddy fields. It has been estimated that global rice production is responsible for 11% of total anthropogenic CH4 emissions. Doesn't come close to meat, but as methane is initially more powerful in warming the earth, it has to be considered a problem. Other scientific studies by the UN and others say that agriculture contributes much closer to 15 to 20 percent of world greenhouse gas emissions, largely comprised of CH4, CO2 and NO. And the funky breakdown of these are etheric fermentation 39.3, manure left on pasture 15.2, synthetic fertilizers 11.8, Rice cultivation, 10.1 or 11, depending on which report you read. Manure management, 6.8. Other, which includes cultivation of organic soils and manure applied to soils, 16.8. <laughs> industrial sources of CO2 was estimated at 37.1 billion tonnes. Nearly a third of the world's energy consumption and 36% of carbon dioxide emissions are attributable to manufacturing industries. The large primary culprits are chemical, petrochemicals, iron and steel, cement, paper and pulp, and other minerals and metals, which account for more than two-thirds of this amount. It's estimated that global carbon dioxide emissions from fossil fuels and industry will reach around 36.8 billion tonnes in 2019, and that won't change a lot with COVID, but it'll change by probably 7%, maybe. In 2016, Australia was the biggest net exporter of coal, with 32% of global exports. That's 389 MT out of 1,213 MT total. 
and was the fourth highest producer with 6.9 of global production. That's 503 MT out of 7,269 MT total. Previously, China was thought to be the largest importer of this nasty, dirty fuel, only to be surpassed by peat burning. But Japan and India have overtaken them. And here are the figures. Oil and gas are about half the emitters, and in Finland and Iceland, peat burning is very popular. I must stop going on about that. I just like saying it. Peat burning. It's like you're going after a very unpopular bloke down the pub. The effects of climate change or global warming are clearly visible, and yet there are people who put their faith in the tried policy of silicone headwashing or believing their deity will fix it all, or even worse, will provide an express elevator to lots of people who contributed to this mess because they are quote-unquote good people, and the rest of us will deal with hell, brimstone, and a life of eating unmarinated veggie meat substitutes and sea slugs. I'm never gonna stop It's possible that these people, whom I like to call jaded mindless reactionaries, or Trump supporters for short, will never be persuaded of the realities of climate change until they find themselves buried under several feet of water and can cheer themselves up by saying it's all in God's big plan, me being homeless and drowned. The trouble is, these are the very people who need to be reached. People who are already convinced are convinced. And it might be advisable for you not to call them jaded reactionaries or make fun of their deeply held religious beliefs, as I just did now. I think it ought to be attempted, though, as we need everybody on side, or at least most people. Why should we feel sad tonight? Why should we feel sad tonight? Now that's a lot of doom and gloom for you, but there are some practical ways of ameliorating emissions other than some of the things I've mentioned, and even some crazy schemes that may attempt to remove the very gases or stop the sun from creating such devastation in order to reduce the sins of our fathers and our fathers' fathers and our fathers' 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 fathers and our fathers' 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 fathers, 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 fathers and us. You've got to stop, I'll take a few from it. Well, first off, let's take a look at agriculture. Now, assuming everyone is not going to go vegan, which I think with the current state of vegan alternatives to food is a reasonable assumption, are there ways of reducing GHG emissions that are commercially viable? As has been stated endlessly, and for good reason, the meat and dairy industry have been singled out as a major contributor of CH4, nitrogen oxide, and particularly due to forest clearance, CO2 but there appear to be some ways in which the industry can maybe redeem itself. Well, not in the eyes of vegans, obviously, but it might make the rest of us bloodthirsty bastards feel slightly less destructive. So can we feed our poor unfortunate victims differently before we bash in their heads or slice their necks and steal their children? Well, for a start, there is this thing called silvopastoral systems which include shrubs and trees with edible leaves or fruits as well as herbage. Presently, cattle production mostly occurs on cleared pastures, with only herbaceous plants, such as grasses, grown as food for cows. Even worse, they're forced to consume soya, not only contributing massively to deforestation, but also, it's soya. Ironically, the very thing I fight all my life to avoid drinking is fed to the very cows that produce the thing I like putting in my coffee and on my cornflakes. This new sustainable approach, including planting of fodder trees, has already been successful in several countries. 
including the plant Canmistius polemis. Don't know why I'm trying to do a foreign accent, but I'm not quite sure I'm pronouncing it correctly. Which is now widely used for cattle feed in Australia. And the shrub Lucana in Colombia. And other flora with unpronounceable Latin names. Anyway, you get the idea. Feed them different stuff. Also, treat these creatures better. It's been shown that the number of diseases and mortality that is involved in poor treatment of industrial farmed animals actually increases greenhouse emissions. Apart from the poor old chicken, where its mortality is sort of written off because of the land usage involved in organic and free range. Poor little chicken. Another way to reduce CH4 produced by ruminants are supplements, including enzymes such as 3-NOP, or 3-NOP, that can actually reduce the gas in dairy cows by about 30%. Silent Green is people! And just to add another homage to 70s sci-fi, the artificial production of flesh tissue. Mmm, artificial. Yes, it sounds appetising. It's steak, Jim, but not as we know it. In the past, this has been a bit expensive and less appealing to people who get upset about mucking around with genetically modified cucumbers. But as meat production has come under greater scrutiny on the grounds of welfare and emissions, it may be seen as a new way out for us omnivores, who can run around happily chomping down 50 hamburgers a day with t-shirts saying, in your face vegans, until our systems get so clogged up with the stuff we end up looking like the last days of Elvis. Still, until they do something to actually replicate milk properly and make a decent cheddar, the other improvements in farming cattle may need to be employed for a while. There are, of course, other crops that are not helping the situation. Palm oil, avocados, coffee. In fact, any monocrop expanded to industrial levels has innate problems relating to loss of diversity, water usage. Coffee is particularly thirsty. I like to be busy, busy bee, being just as busy as a bee can be, flying all around the wild hedgerows, stinging all the... Not forgetting poor old bees and the enduring debates surrounding pesticides and phosphates. There's another thing we can do, we can use organic fertilisers, such as vermeo composting. And we can upgrade old technologies to new eco-friendly technologies. New machines use less power and produce less pollution than the previous old machines. The only negative impact is that the initial costs associated with the change might be considerable. But in the long run, the result of making such a change could be positive. The alternative, of course, is the completely contradictory opting for using old machinery rather than buying new ones, which sort of cancels out the upgrading I just mentioned before. Hey guys, I'm not making the rules, I'm just reading tons and tons of information from reports. There's also creation of biodiesel from oil seed plants, such as canola and sunflower oils. But then we are kind of going down the monocrop idea as well. There's using manure obtained from animals as fuel, and as current agriculture stands, there's plenty of this about. Apart from a lot of the politicians around these days who seem to produce this stuff with no problem at all. There's use of technology to regulate the use of resources and to facilitate environmentally friendly farming. You can use sensors in agriculture. Technology has become so powerful these days that little investment can reduce agricultural costs extensively. I thought we were an autonomous collective! You're fooling yourself. We're living in a dictatorship. A self-perpetuating autocracy in which the working classes... Oh, get... there you go, bringing class into it again! That's what it's all about. Crop rotation and weed management practices. Yes, it's back to the Middle Ages we go. Absolutely marvellous. Mm. Oh yes, Miss Cutterpuff, they're very grand. 
I wonder if we should show them to the Major. Oh, I think you should show them to the Major. I anyway, think. that's about as much as I want to do on farming before this becomes a particularly earnest and boring episode of The Archers. <laughs> Next up, waste management. Well, as we've already covered this reasonably extensively, all I have to add to this is that whether you're a proponent of energy from waste with combined heat and power, or recycling, or as I maintain, a combination of both, one thing is for certain. Chucking things in the sea or burying it is not a long-term option. And we need these holes to bury all that sequestered carbon. So do something else with your waste. She wants what she wants, so she knows what she wants, but she wants it. Touching on something I mentioned a little earlier is the changing of consumerist practices. Now this is only a personal view and I'm willing to be contradicted by some eminent and infinitely more brilliant person than myself. But for what it's worth, here goes. Dave Gorman once did a very good bit on how when purchasing a plug for his sink he ended up with a pack of 14 of every imaginable dimension and was able to illustrate the depth of our current overproduction and therefore overconsumption of energy with the emphasis of consumerism over utility. I often wonder when I'm clearing out my flat on a biannual basis why I have a drawer full of kettle leads and video cables and various things you get with every router and computer and appliance that you've already got. And you go, well I'd better not throw it away. I may need it at some point. The chance of every hoarder shamed on some crappy TV program and ignoring the inevitability that the next time you go to upgrade your computer as the updates from your antiviral software manage to cripple the speed of your current device. What the fuck? The 9000 series is the most reliable computer ever made. I'm sorry, Dave. I'm afraid I can't do that. Yeah, but my name's Andrew. I think you know what the problem is just as well as I do. In just the way you hoped when you installed that antiviral software, to prevent viruses from crippling the processing speed of your current device. Well, this leads me to just one example of how utility could assist in reducing energy usage by not constantly manufacturing things we don't actually need. I mean, why do we buy new computers? Because the speed of the processing from new software instantly makes your brand new purchase from the land of the laminated book of dreams out of date. As soon as it's presented to you, from that Raiders of the Lost Ark sized warehouse at the back. But what if instead of getting a whole new device, we had a modular system where you merely upgraded the processor and the memory? Modular concepts have been around for a long time and an emphasis on utility would mean a change in design and business models. Check the wheels, check the brakes, check the old windscreen here. Yeah, I'm going to also the... check the muffler bearing. I had a bit of a, bit of a whine. I, I When's the last time, yeah, everything should be the last okay, time just... you had the muffler bearing checked? Muffler bearing must have bit been of a while. the last service oh, couple of years. Bit of a while. You don't maintain your cars yourself? But it would certainly reduce energy usage if car manufacturers, producers of consumer goods like televisions and vehicles, actually placed their emphasis on servicing rather than just producing more and more new stuff. Radio rentals. You'll be glued to our sets, not stuck with them. Now, pre-COVID-19, it seemed impossible to see how any company would be persuaded to put emphasis on servicing over production. But it's quite possible a lack of consumer spending may be an incentive. The fashion industry is also beginning to gain awareness. 
forced upon it by consumer concerns driven in part by the media. And financial pressures and the ludicrous trade policies of President Trump and Brexit may force people to make do with what they actually have rather than buying another new shiny thing. <coughs> Clearly, the best way to reduce emissions, however, would be to alter the way energy is produced. But Jesus Christ. Leaving aside the obvious negatives such as plastic pollution, deforestation, exploitation of workers, antibiotic resistance, cross-species flu, etc., consumerism in of itself is not a bad thing. In terms of GHG, anyway. It's where it gets its energy from, which is the main problem. No shit, Sherlock! Want to see how to save energy with sunshine? Those Lennox solar panels collect heat from the sun and transfer it to this Lennox hot water and home heating system. Right, Dave Lennox? Right. And this Lennox solar made heat pump provides backup heat in winter and cools the house in summer. Super efficient. Back in the 70s, solar technology didn't appear to be a viable alternative to all that lovely, lovely oil. And beautiful honest dirt in the form of coal that apparently needs to be painted before using it in demonstration purposes. This is coal. Don't be afraid. The Don't be scared. Won't the treasurer you. knows the rule on crops. It's coal. It was dug up by men and women who work and live in the electorates of those who... Bollocks, 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 cobblers... Bollocks, 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 bollocks. Oh, and some more bollocks. But now that Australia's been on fire and there's been four years of drought, the new improved solar technology may appear slightly more appealing. However, for some reason, Scottmo would rather make fun of environmental concerns with an hilarious reactionary stand up routine. Wave power and wind turbines are becoming more effective. Wind! I never understood wind, and I know windmills very much. I've studied it better than anybody. I know it's very expensive. They're made in China and Germany mostly. Very few made here, almost none. But they're manufactured tremendous, if you're into this, tremendous fumes, gases are spewing into the atmosphere. You know, we have a world, right? So the world is tiny compared to the universe. Bollocks, 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 bollocks. Attempts at esoteric bullshit. Bollocks, bollocks, bollocks. I see these advertisements on television and they have windmills in the background and people think, oh, they're so pretty. Well, they're not pretty to us when we're surrounded by them. So the obvious critique is that these things deface the landscape. Although having the entire country underwater may be seen as a rather more extreme form of landscaping. Large hydroelectric schemes have its critics too, and there are serious implications when embarking on schemes that have major impact on the immediate surroundings, people's homes and wildlife, and the initial carbon footprint in construction. But the question is, are these negatives worth taking if the power produced is significantly clearer? On top of all of that, the Union of Concerned Scientists found large hydroelectric dams do pollute with greenhouse gases, something that people say they weren't supposed to do. As the reservoir behind the dam grows or floods over plants that used to be in that area, that material decomposes, releasing CO2 and methane, especially in tropical areas. Emissions vary, but they are just underneath the lowest levels from a natural gas plant. Ah, and then there's the power station in the room. Yes, there's nuclear, of course. Nothing riles an environmentalist more than when it's suggested. And let's face it, even Selwyn Gummer didn't look that comfortable taking a dip in the plant's private swimming pool. Apart from moderately compelling films starring Meryl Streep and Jane Fonda, you had Three Mile Island, Dungeness and Windscalp, sorry, Sellafield. And then there's that big question. How do you get rid of toxic waste that lasts years and years and years? Let's face it, we haven't even managed to get rid of the last of the summer wine or Bernard Manning's. We have a population crisis, directly as a result of policies since the late 1990s, and you see that uh, not just on the impact on public services, but actually there's an argument here about the quality of life. There's an argument here that as bollocks, 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 ill-informed bollocks.
Bollocks, bollocks, bollocks. Which is what the current crop of right-wing ninnies running governments around the world appear to have based their manifestos on. Nuclear waste really irritates me. It should not be a problem at all. In fact, it, as I think Hans Blixer said, nu nu the waste from nuclear is one of its great benefits. There's so little of it. When one thinks of the mountains, the invisible mountains of carbon dioxide, cubic miles of the stuff that we're dumping into the atmosphere every year and wrecking the planet, to fret about 10 cubic meters of, of nuclear waste, which is, I think, the total output of high-level waste in Britain since they started work, is absurd. It's ridiculous. It isn't a problem at all. Anyway, that's power for you. So let's look at some other ways of reducing greenhouse gases before I finish this rant. Along with loads of natural feedback systems, that both reduce and increase CO2 and CH4, methane munching worms at the bottom of the sea, E. coli in the clouds and diatoms. There is the emphasis of planting trees to improve the water table and reintroducing peat bogs. Sorry, I've said it again. But all this is very well-trodden stuff. And in this last bit, by no means even vaguely comprehensive look at global warming, I wanted to give a shout out to those eccentric Heath Robinson-inspired ideas that are suggested may ameliorate GHGs. Yeah, abbreviation's cool. They are based on actual science, though. Now, there's lots of things that are suggested. Removal of gases from the atmosphere, blotting out the sun, using kinetic energy from the movement of plot. No, that's actually, I think, from Doctor Who in the 1970s. Anyway, first up, the removal of GHG gases. No, hang on a minute. First up, the removal of GHGs from the atmosphere. The other one's a tautology, you see. It's just G, gases. Anyway, similar to the way scrubbing technology is employed in EFW. Oh, look, another abbreviation, and in modern coal-burning power stations, direct air capture is currently a nice idea, but has one innate problem. Well, actually, it has two innate problems. It's expensive, both financially, and it requires a lot of energy to make the process work effectively which somewhat undermines the point. Maybe in countries with enough sunshine, this could be exploited to greater effect. But as I'm wandering ignorantly into territory, making me sound like Trump talking about painted and disinfectant cure for COVID, I'm going to end this brief analysis of the process. I only vaguely get this from articles I've read on, let's face it, Wikipedia. Well, and a few other things. There is one small addendum, however. And that's been the suggestion that converting methane to carbon dioxide is preferable because methane is so much more powerful. But then presumably we have to get rid of the carbon dioxide from, I don't know, CO2 munching E. coli in the clouds. Still, moving along. My other favourite in the mechanical, mechanical book of technological wonders is getting rid of the sun. Now, apart from the symptoms, I've heard a couple of ideas floated around on this particular front. Giant mirrors placed above the poles. I bet that would be Trump's favourite if he actually believed in global warming or climate rather than a weather girl on Fox News. The alternative to this approach is that boring old thing called chemistry. The basic idea is to make the clouds whiter. So maybe this would appeal to Trump after all. It would look something like this. Thousands of planes would fly very high and use nozzles to inject millions of tons of light reflecting particles into the stratosphere. It would create a thin chemical cloud of those particles around the whole planet, blocking some sunlight from reaching the surface. It would mimic a giant volcanic eruption, which we know cools the Earth. Back in 1991, Mount Pinatubo erupted in the Philippines. It was the largest eruption... Now, leaving aside the obvious concerns of tinkering with nature on a grand scale, because obviously this has worked out so well for us in the past, 
It does involve putting tiny, tiny bits of sulfur dioxide in the atmosphere. The main thing that's holding it back is the uncertainty about what the exact effects would be and the positives and negatives of its effects and the, the governance and decision-making process for implementing it. So instead of global warming, we could all melt with acid rain. Joke. It's only the trees that will melt, and fish in the sea, the odd statue of Winston Churchill, I don't know. Anyway, those are a couple of the more outlandish sci-fi ideas. I've discovered a new source of energy. No, 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 Professor, I think you've abandoned that. You've decided to concentrate on deriving energy from the kinetic force of planetary movement. Shut up, Baker. So there we have it. Whilst we're riding bicycles, but only old ones yamming our franken-chicken burgers and bathing under the shade of massive plates of glass in the sky, we can reassure ourselves that although we have a very, very short time to do anything about the calamitous, irreversible effects of climate change, there are some good ideas for a new sci-fi holly weird blockbuster. Also, all negative Cassandra pronouncements aside, there are things that can be done, and we need everyone to call upon governments and business to do it. The boycott and, is a very good idea if it's properly targeted. So I think it makes good sense to boycott, say, American corporations or French Of all the challenges faced by the world community in those four years, one has grown clearer than any other in both urgency and importance. I refer to the threat to our global environment. I shall take the opportunity of addressing the General Assembly to speak on that subject alone. Climate should not be a stance on our political perspective. It really is a matter of life and death, to quote a Powell and Pressburger film, for everyone. When the night shows the signals grow on radio are the strange things they come and go as early warnings strand established have no place to hide still waiting for the swollen easter tide there's no point in direction we cannot even choose a side. I took the old track from Hollow Shoulder across the borders on the tall cliffs 
they were getting old, the sons and daughters. The jaded underworld was riding high. Wales are still her metal at the sky. And as the nail sunk in the clouds, the rain was warm and soaked the ground. Lord, here comes the flood. We'll say goodbye to flesh and blood. If again the seas are silent and any still alive, it'll be those who gave their island to survive. Drink up, dreamers, you're running dry. When the flood calls, you have no home, you have no walls. And the thunder crash, you're a thousand miles within a flash. Don't be afraid to cry of what you see. And is gone, there's only you and me. And if we wait before the dawn, they'll use up what we used to be. Lord, here comes the flood. We'll say goodbye to flesh and blood. If again the seas of silence in hell is still alive, it'll be those who gave their island to survive. Drink up, dreamers.